Alright, so today we are reading through Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. So if you guys can turn there, it's 550, 553 in the Red Bible. Um, otherwise, it's between Proverbs and Song of Song. Okay, so, verse 3 through 11, if you guys can follow along as I read, it starts and says, What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. And around and around goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness, a man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of the later things yet to be among those who come after. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, as we study through your word today, uh, I just pray that you can open our eyes to the truth in it, Lord, that you can help us wrestle with difficult questions, um, and uh, that through it we can, we can find a certain amount of peace um, in, in your sovereignty, in your uh, greatness, Lord. Um, I pray that uh, during this time, Lord, uh, that you teach through me, um, that uh, anything you want heard is said, anything you do not want heard is not said. Uh, and I pray all these things in your name. Amen. So, over the years, uh, as I've been working here at Jake as well, um, I have been slowly taking more and more responsibility over the tech side of things in this church. Um, and now it's officially my job, they, they handed me the keys to the kingdom. Um, of technology, and uh, so uh, I've been doing a lot of tech stuff, but a year, years ago, um, I was just starting to take over the sanctuary stuff for Sundays, um, and I got a call at about 6 in the morning that woke me up, and so I'm like all groggy, and Jack Reimer's on the, the other side of the phone, because he was writing PowerPoint, and he's like, hey, the projectors aren't working, I'm like, oh. All right, so over the phone, I'm trying to like fix the problem. So we're trying to troubleshoot this problem over the phone and nothing is working. And so I'm getting more and more stressed out as we're trying things and they're not working. And, and I, I told Jack, I was like, okay, just print out lyric sheets so that way at least we can do church. So that way people don't have to like try and sing based off of their memory. So, and, and then in the meantime, we will continue to try and fix the projectors. Um, and, and so for the next hour and a half, we are troubleshooting the entire video system set up uh, in the sanctuary and nothing is working. Um, and I'm thinking to myself, like, I have to get this working, right? Like, I, I don't want to distract people uh, from worship because something like the projectors isn't working, okay? So I'm like, I have to get this fixed. And every second that goes by that it wasn't fixed, I, there's like this added time pressure on me. So I'm just feeling really weighed down. I'm like, I have to fix this now. And I'm getting super stressed out and feeling a ton of pressure. And so I thought to myself, I was like, okay, I can't do this over the phone, I have to go to the church. So I get dressed, and while I'm getting dressed, I'm still trying to like think of a solution, and it's driving me crazy. And then when I'm done, I, I, I wake up Beth, and I tell her, I'm like, I'm sorry, like we can't drive to church together, I have to get to the church because I need to fix the projectors. Um, and uh, Beth, who is half asleep, sort of like rolls over, and she's like, honey, 
it's okay. God will still be worshipped. It's <laughs> Beth has way more faith than I do. And instantly, all of my stress was gone. See, I, I calmed down all of a sudden because I realized that it didn't matter if the projectors got fixed or not. So the status of the projectors could not stop God from being glorified. And so I calmed down, I drove to church, and by God's grace, the projectors got fixed. Have you guys ever heard the phrase, it's not the end of the world? Yeah? So why, why do we tell people this? Like, why, why do we, when someone's freaking out, why do we go up to them and we're like, hey, it's not the end of the world. It's to remove pressure, right? Like to, to calm them down, to, to tell them that their very real struggle in the much larger context so that they can gain some perspective. They, like, like, yes, it was super stressful that the projectors were not working a couple of hours before church started. But it wasn't the end of the world. You know, in, in the context of the existence of the earth, it's not as big of a deal as it felt like it was. Yes, as, as people, as Americans, you know, for you as students in the quote unquote future of the church, you have a lot of pressure, right? Pre pressure to, to work hard to make something of yourselves. Uh, you, you have pressure to become contributing members of society, to, to get a good education so you can get a good job, so you can uh, uh, live not in your parents' house. You have pressure to serve the church because if no one serves in the church, the church doesn't work. You know, there's, there's pressure to preach the gospel to your friends because their salvation is your responsibility, which isn't true. But it can feel like that sometimes. You know, there's a crazy amount of pressure on you guys. And so the question is, with all of the pressure on you, all the pressure on you to do a good job, how are you supposed to handle it without stress? Well, God's answer is to give us the book of Ecclesiastes and to remind us that it's not the end of the world. And he does this by showing us the meaninglessness of our work, by giving us a good motivation for our work. Okay, so to start off here, the preacher speaks into the meaninglessness of our work. Okay, in this passage, the preacher which is the name that's given to the person who's speaking throughout Ecclesiastes, asks a really big question. In verse 3, he asks, What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? Basically, the preacher is asking, What do we get from all of our work this side of heaven? And then, like, in a crazy, strange shift of topic, he starts talking about how the earth remains forever, uh, that the sun is rising and setting repeatedly, uh, that the wind just goes round and round, that streams are always running into the sea. Okay, he, he talks about how there's nothing new under the sun, that everything that is under the sun has always been under the sun, and it will continue to be under the sun. And he goes on and says that future things won't remember present things, just like how present things don't remember past things. Okay, in other words, what we do now won't be remembered later. Now, I do want to clarify some things about this passage. Okay, so the first thing that I want to clarify is that this is poetry. Okay, uh, these are broad brush statements or generalizations. Um, the preacher uh, who wrote this 
in, in this poetic description of creation, he's not strictly being accurate. Okay? Because we all know there's new things, right? Cars did not exist when this book was written. Computers didn't exist. There, there's a lot of things on the earth now that did not exist before. But generally, he's right. You know, the winds haven't changed. The seas haven't changed. The mountains and the earth have not changed. And the movement of the stars has not changed. Okay, but again, why is this the response to the question, what do we get from our work this side of heaven? Okay, why is this the thing that he uses to answer the question? You know, and, and to me, what I hear in this description of the world that's under the sun, that exists, has always existed, and will continue to exist, is that no matter what anyone does, no matter how hard someone works or how hard they don't work, no matter how many successes they have or how many failures they have, they can't change the world. Our, our failures won't end the world and our successes won't make it better. See, our work under the sun has no consequential meaning. Our work is meaningless, and that's calming. Yep, I said it. The meaninglessness of our work is calming. You know? Guys, five years ago when I first started teaching from God's word, um, I felt this incredible amount of pressure to do God's word justice. Yeah, I actually felt like I was carrying the weight of other people's salvation on my shoulders. And that, that, that if I spoke powerfully and accurately, that many people would come to faith. But if I spoke poorly, if I spoke inaccurately, that many people would leave the faith. You know, and I would just I would get so stressed out by all of this pressure of doing a good job in my messages. I, I would get so stressed out that I would, I would lose sleep. I would stay up all night thinking about it. Um, I would have weird body things happen to me, like, like sweating, I would sweat a lot. My hands would get super clammy. Um, I went to the bathroom a lot before I would get up to speak. <laughs> My wife's like shaking her head at me. Um, you know, it was it was it was weird. And and then in one of my my uh, check-ins with uh, Pastor Jonathan uh, early on, uh, he he like saw how stressed out I was getting, um, and, and he told me something that I will never forget. So this is what he said, something to the effect of, "You'll never be able to give a message so bad that you can stop God's gospel work." And you'll never be able to give a message so good that you can make God's gospel work. And I calmed down. I found so much comfort in knowing that my work could not bring someone to faith. And that my work also could not make someone leave the faith. Guys, my work has no meaningful consequences. Because I'm not God. And the, the only one that has meaningful consequences in his actions is God. Only God and not me can do this. Because only God has real authority over creation. And that calms me down. How are you guys supposed to handle the pressure of doing a good job without stress? It's by understanding that your work has no meaningful consequences. And so there isn't any real pressure to do a good job. You guys, your failures will not end the world, I promise. And your successes, they won't make it better. And the consequences of your work, they're not on you. They're on God. 
And we see this the most clearly on the cross. Because let's be honest, we mess up. We fail a lot. You know, our work is bad and we sin constantly. And hear me when I say this. There are meaningful consequences for our failure to do good works. But the meaningful consequences weren't put on you and me. It was Christ who took all of our failures, all of our sins, mistakes, and bad works, and bore the consequences of them when he died on the cross. And because of that, the pressure that you guys feel to do a good job is a pressure that you put on yourself or that others put on you. But it's not a pressure that God puts on you. And so it has no real authority. You see, when you do bad work, the very, very good work of Christ on the cross can calm you down. Because the consequences have been taken from you already. You guys, to be calm when you work is to simply remember and believe that Christ and not you, is Lord and Savior. Which means that your good or bad work has no meaningful consequences. Because Christ took them from you. You guys, your work can't change the world. Okay, but Christ's work through you can and does. And that's calming. Okay, so, so our work is meaningless, and that's, and that's calming. Okay, but it also means that we have uh, no pressure or consequences to motivate us to do good work. Right? And so we, we need a new motivation. Uh, we, need, we need a good motivation, not like an oppressive motivation, but something good. So, so how do we find a new motivation? Okay, how do we find a new, motiv a new good motivation for our work? You know, and to find this in the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, we actually have to look through the context of creation. Ecclesiastes should be read through the lens of God's creation of all things. Okay, and, and, and when God created all things, okay, he, he would create something and he kept calling it good. Okay, so, so effectively, God was doing good work. Okay, and then he created Adam and Eve, and he commanded them to do the same told them to do good work, to, to work the earth and help it prosper. Okay, and the reason why he told them to do this is because through their work, they reflected God's glory. Okay, now some people might say that, that this is God being like selfish or, or vain. But to be honest, this is actually God's greatest gift to us. Okay, reflecting God's glory by doing his good work is the most satisfying, joyful thing that we can do. Okay, and we see this throughout the entire Bible. But I want to give you guys some of the strongest examples from Psalm 119. Okay, Psalm 119 is the psalm that was written by King David where he is singing about the joys of following God's commands. Okay, so here's, here's some excerpts. I'm going to read them to you. So verses 14 through 16. David is singing, In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in riches. I will meditate on your precepts, God's rules, and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes, his laws, and I will not forget your word. Okay, verse 18. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. Verse 20, my soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. Verse 35, lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. And on and on and on. It's 176 verses talking about the joy found in following God's commands and doing good work. Guys, the motivation for our work, the good motivation for our work, is the joy that we receive from God through it. 
You see, God commands us to do good work. He commands us to follow his laws. He commands us to do the best work that we can possibly do. Firstly, because it's right. But also, and incredibly, because he wants us to experience the joy of it. You know, and, and I'll be honest, that joy that we experience from doing God's good work is not something that I can really explain. It kind of has to be felt. Guys, in, in the musical world, there's, there's uh, like two main uh, roles, parts, there's two main parts. There's, there's a melody, which is the song itself, and then a harmony, which are harmonies, which support the song, okay? And, and there's rules around the harmonies, okay? You, you could play any notes around the melody and say it's a harmony, but it won't sound very good. Okay, so there's, there's rules that you have to follow with harmony. And when harmonies are done well, it often causes us to experience like incredible joy. Okay, for, for the people who are doing them and the people who are, are listening to them. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and play a song uh, and, and I want you guys to feel the difference between uh, just when you just hear the melody and when the harmonies start coming in. So it's gonna be up here on the screen.
Ecclesiastes finds calm in the stress of work by remembering that his work is meaningless. He can't change the world, which certainly removes the pressure of having to do good work. But there is an underlying idea that isn't said, and that's that while individually our work has no meaning, when it is within the much larger plan of God's glory. Not only is there no pressure, but there is incredible joy. Okay, so, so we can have zero pressure and incredible joy when we recognize that we are a part of God's glorious redemptive plan. Um, apparently, I wanted to play a lot of songs for you guys today. So I have another one that I think reflects this idea of no pressure and incredible joy in God's plan beautifully. Okay, it is uh, Through Heaven's Eyes from the, the movie Prince of Egypt. So, I know, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna play this song too. My children, let us give thanks for this bountiful food. And let us also give thanks for the presence of this brave young man who we are here tonight. Please, I wish you wouldn't. I've done nothing in my life worth honoring. First you rescue Sephora from Egypt, then you defend my younger daughters from brigands. You think that is lucky? It seems you do not know what is worthy of honor. A single thread in a tapestry, though its color brightly shine, can never see its purpose in the pattern of the grand design. And the stone that sits on the very top of the mountain's mighty face doesn't think it's more important than the stones that form the base. So how can you see what your life is worth or where your value lies? You can never see through the eyes of man. You must look at your life. Look at your life through heaven's eyes. And 
is a less than a cool, fresh spring. And to one lost ship, a shepherd boy is greater than the richest king. If a man loses everything he owns, is he truly lost his worth? Or is it the beginning of a new and brighter birth? To look at his light through heaven's eyes And that's what shall we have with you Though there's little to be found When all you've got is nothing There's a lot to go around The road of life can escape when you've been rolled about By the winds of change and chance And though you never know all the steps Dance with me You oh, must God. learn to join the dance you must learn to join the dance. circumstances, our successes, our failures, and our work, when, when you and I only see what's under the sun, there is an incredible stress to do a good job, and a depression when we fail. But when we look above ourselves, when we see beyond what is under the sun, and you and I recognize that we are simply and incredibly a part of God's grand redemptive plan to save all of creation from sin and death. You will see that everything you do has meaning because God has made it meaningful. And when you believe that, when you believe that, you will gain a deep calm and an incredible joy in all of your work. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much for taking the burden off of our shoulders. I thank you for this book and these words of the preacher that we can know that we cannot change the world, that that burden rests solely with you. And that is such a comfort because you have changed the world. You will redeem everything in all of creation, God, and you will bring us back home to you. We would just believe in you. Lord, I pray that for anyone here who's stressed, they can find comfort in your greatness, that they can find joy in their work, and that anyone here who does not believe in you, that they can be drawn to this, this wonderful peace that can come from being with you. I just pray that all in your name. Amen.